Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's PR COVID-19 webinar, Disaster Management, the Effects and Management of COVID-19 Whilst uh, Looking into the Future. I'm Chris Engelbrecht, USA member of PRC's Technical Committee 1.5 on Disaster Management, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Uh, next slide, please. First, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, please keep your microphones muted, if you would, and keep your video turned off during the presentation to avoid background noise and connection issues, of course, with the exception of our speakers as they uh, present. Uh, also, please use the chat function to ask any questions at any time during the presentations. Uh, I will collect the questions and direct them to the appropriate speaker during the Q&A session. Uh, also, if you would, please identify which speaker your question is directed to in your post. Uh, since we do have attendees from around the globe, uh, if you would, include your full name and country in your Zoom identification. That'll help us know who's joined us today. And this can be accomplished by hovering over your name in the participant list and clicking rename. Next slide, please. And uh, Patrick, it appears we have a, a large gray box still in the middle of our uh, presentation. There we go. Thank you. So today's webinar will feature some very informative speakers from both PRC and the Transportation Research Board. Uh, we're going to begin with welcome remarks from both PRC and TRB. Uh, this will be followed by presentations from members of each organization and then a short question and answer session. So remember to post your questions in the chat throughout our presentation. And then finally, a, a wrap up and closing comments. Next slide, please. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Patrick Melajak, Secretary General of PRC, to offer some welcome remarks. Um, yep. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, uh, Chris. It's really welcome. I'm very happy to be with you uh, today. It's uh, my name is Patrick Melajak. I would be based in Paris. I'm the Secretary General of PIARC. PIARC is the World Road Association. We, you may be more familiar with that name. Maybe we were founded uh, 110 years ago as an association, non-profit, non-political association with one objective, which is to facilitate the exchange of knowledge on roads uh, and road transport on all topics, road safety, pavement, economics, etc. Uh, we have 125 member governments uh, there are our lead members as well as regions, companies, research institutes, universities, individuals, etc. The way we work is to mobilize the experience and knowledge of 100 and uh, sorry, and, uh, sorry, 1,200 experts from more than 80 countries, and they work through technical committees and task forces. Uh, you have here the list of those committees. They are all very active uh, at the time. And the one that is organizing this work today is this one here on the left, uh, 1.5 disaster management. And, but as you can see, we also have tunnels, we also have electric road systems. Just feel free to contact me uh, anytime if you're interested. What we do is knowledge exchange. The way we do that is through uh, committees. Those committees well, are a good way to facilitate dialogue between peers on all these topics that were presented on the previous slide, for them to build a network of colleagues that will we'll stay uh, forever and to work common, uh, towards commonly agreed deliverables. Those deliverables can be reports, literature reviews, seminars and workshops in low income countries in particular, online manuals, software and tools, HTM4 and QRAM, uh, a quarterly magazine, World Roads. I guess many of you already receive it. And this is usually available in English, French, and Spanish, and usually free of charge. We also organize some congresses uh, that you may have uh, uh, been involved in. Uh, the last one uh, uh, was organized in Abu Dhabi in October 2019, where we disseminate our deliverables and also facilitate more discussions. Uh, COVID-19, well, we set up a response team more than a year ago, as soon as the pandemic was uh, upon us here in Europe and Northern America, and we decided that we needed to help our members exchange ideas, confront this new reality, and basically exchange solutions. So thank you very much to all these colleagues, including Yukio Adachi, of course. We organized more than 20 webinars, actually more than 30, 
in English mainly, as well as in French and Spanish. Some of them were really broad, others were focused on freight, for example, on a given topic, uh, I would say. Uh, they are all available from our website. Some partner organizations agreed to join our webinars as panelists, including TRB, with, uh, with which we are very happy to organize this webinar today, the International Road Union, Ertico in Europe about ITS, the International Transport Forum, to name just a few. And they broadened really the scope of what we, we covered in our webinars. We were able to develop two reports, quite detailed ones, uh, one that presents uh, issues that were identified and how they were handled, so best practice, and another report, which is a survey of the responses from all over the world. They are available from our website and they are already, already available in the three working languages of the association. So please feel free to go there and check them and, 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 and benefit from the work and comments will be always welcome. Thanks a lot. Thank you very, thank you very much, Chris, back to you. All right, thank you, Patrick. So next up, I'd like to introduce uh, Bill Anderson with uh, TRB, he's a senior program officer uh, for some welcome remarks. Hello, everybody. I uh, hope you're enjoying your day thus far. Uh, thank you for participating in today's webinar. This is a very important issue to TRB. We have a number of resilience and emergency management committees. So if you're interested in participating in those particular committees, I'll drop some information in our chat box here on how you can do that. So as already stated, I am Bill Anderson with the Transportation Research Board. And TRB is actually part of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Uh, the National Academies, as we call it, uh, was established back in 1863 at a time period in the United States when science and research was producing a lot of new uh, technologies and uh, uh, processes that the United States needed better in advice as to how these things could actually be utilized. With that, Abraham Lincoln, who was our president at the time, established the National Academies of Science to bring all of these experts together to figure out how they could become uh, public goods for the, the U.S. to benefit from. Transportation Research Board, which is one of seven boards of the National Academies, was formed 100 years ago, as you all may have known from our annual meeting of uh, 2020, this year, uh, of 2021 this past year. Uh, and next year, we're gonna be celebrating 101 years. Uh, we are gonna be holding our annual meeting in person in Washington, DC uh, during the month of January, January 9 through 13. We currently have a call for papers open right now. So if you're interested in participating in annual meeting, Take a look, I'll also drop a link to where the call for papers is, and submit a paper on your current research or your current programs uh, so that we can consider it for a presentation at annual meeting. Um, the deadline for submitting that is August 1. I come from the technical activities division within the TRB, and there are more than 400 sections committees, and subcommittees that work on a wide variety of topics of which we have nearly uh, 40 individuals from PIAR who are US representatives that also serve on these uh, committees and subcommittees. So we have a strong relationship with PIAR that goes back a very long time. And we continue to grow this experience through efforts like this uh, webinar series here. Today, you're gonna to hear a little bit more about the work that some of our members have been doing uh, around COVID-19 and disaster management during a pandemic. And I will include uh, more information about some of the reports that are being produced. Since uh, the 9-11 terrorist attacks uh, in 2001, we've had over 300 reports produced in multiple modes of transportation to improve the resilience and security and safety of our transportation system. And once again, I'll continue to provide as much information as I can during this webinar in the chat so you have access to many of those documents. Enjoy the webinar today, sit back, and if you ever need any assistance, you can always contact me via email and I'll provide that also in the chat. Enjoy, thank you. All right, thank you, Bill. I'll now turn it over to Yukio Adachi, Chair of PRC's Technical Committee 1.5 on Disaster Management for a welcome and introduction of PRC activity. 
Thank you, Chris. My name is Yukio Adachi, uh, Chair of the uh, Technical Committee 1.5 Disaster Management of Pyrk. I'm from the uh, Hanshin Expressway Company Limited, Osaka, Japan. Now I'm talk about the uh, brief introduction of our Technical Committee activities. Next slide, please. The 2020 to 2023 cycle started on February 2020. This is a photo of our members at the uh, kickoff meeting in Paris. We are uh, a relatively small group, but we have very active members. Next slide, please. Our former committee was born in 1990. Since then, we have produced a lot of reports. These photos showed some of our reports. The latest reports are disaster information management for road administrators, risk management for emergency situations. These reports are available at the PIAC website. Next slide, please. The 2020 to 2023 cycle has the three topics to study. The first topic is information and communication in disaster management. We use the uh, different kind of the uh, big data and social network information for the uh, disaster management. How we collect them, how we manage them, and how we share them. We are studying right now. Next slide, please. The second topic is the financial aspect of the disaster management. We make a lot of financial considerations in mitigation phase, preparedness phase, response phase, and recovery phase in disaster management. We are exploring the good practices and we are identifying good case studies. Next slide, please. The last topic is the update the disaster management manual. We're sorry that this manual has not been uploaded to the PIAC website yet, but when completed, this will be the very first and unique manual that deal with the road disaster management techniques. We believe that this manual will give you a great help in disaster management activities. Next slide, please. Finally, I will introduce the Calgary Congress 2022. As you may know that the PIAC has the Winter and Resilience Congress in February next year. This is the first Congress to be held in virtually. Our TC 1.5 will hold three virtual sessions, two online technical sessions and one networking session. Please join together. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Yukio. I'll now turn it over to Herbie Lasad, Chair of TRB's AMR002, for a welcome and introduction of TRB activity. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're at in the world. Um, I was in, uh, um, I'm, I'm the chair for TRB's uh, Subcommittee on Transportation Emergency Management Practices and Innovations. And our mission is to be the voice and leader of practices and innovations emergency management from a holistic perspective through partnerships, advocacy, research program implementation, policy development, awareness, and training. I spent uh, about 10 years working for the California Department of Transportation as their emergency manager. And um, I also uh, was the um, uh, executive uh, a, a director for Haiti Engineering, which is a nonprofit organization helping countries around the world post-disaster and, um, and um, after disasters as well. Um, so the, the, I, I wanna thank TRB and PR for putting on this webinar, especially Ikayo Dashi of Japan for taking the lead. Uh, I've been involved with TRB for about 15 years, PR for about 10. The presentations are wonderful and timely. Um, I do wanna um, mention that uh, while I'm in the United States, my family roots are in the country of Haiti and people continue to uh, die from COVID, including 
a cousin of mine's uh, Nadine Russo, a banker that died uh, about a month ago from COVID. So no matter how rich you may be, you are only as rich as your uh, country is poor. So Haiti being the poorest country in the Western hemisphere and she having no access to the vaccine. So I uh, just wanna say, uh, please enjoy these presentations and I hope the information is useful to your organization and your country. Uh, thank you. All right, thanks so much, Herbie. We're now gonna move into our presentations by PRC and TRB. And our first presentation will be given by Nal Fisher. He's our English speaking secretary of PR Technical Committee 1.5 from New Zealand. Uh, now the microphone's yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, brilliant. Yes, thank you. Herbie, I'm very sorry to hear your news there about your um, your friends and family in, um, in, in Haiti. Um, thank you for that introduction. As I said, my, my name is Neil Fisher and I am the English speaking secretary of PIARC and you'll see from my day job there that I am the principal advisor for land transport security for an organization called Waka Katahi. Waka Katahi is the indigenous name in New Zealand for our national New Zealand transport agency and the Waka Katahi basically means uh, one vessel traveling together which is a really important indigenous um thought that we have for for travel in new zealand but my role as, a, as principal land transport security changed somewhat with covid and after my attendance at a conference in pi Arc, um, very very early in 2020 i then returned and i was asked to establish um, our national covid response team for the transport sector and then from there run that for um for the following year so we've had a very, very different experience to COVID and the rest of the country. And what I think I've got to tell you is, um, is a unique story that I don't has really has been seen in many places around the world. And I'm gonna focus in on one area that I think is a real important learning for us about how we've done what we did. And hopefully some of that will be able to be used by, um, by other people. So next slide, please. I'm just gonna briefly talk about the, um, the contents and I'm going to start by introducing myself and letting you know why I have the experience that I have. Then I'm going to talk about the organisation I work for briefly and introduce you to New Zealand because we are very different. And I think when I explain why that is, you're going to see why maybe the effects of COVID have been somewhat different. And then I'm going to talk about basically the consulting, the manual, the playbook that we had at the time to, um, to undertake the COVID response. And then from there, I'm going to talk about how we have a structure. And then I think for me, what our key success and why we did, um, why we've had the success that we have dealing with COVID. Next slide, please. So I was, um, I was asked, uh, you can just press that twice. I was asked to provide a, um, a photo of myself as a, as a way of an introductory measure. And um, basically I thought I won't provide one, I'll provide many. And it's a very brief story of my career. On the right hand side, you'll see that I was a career police officer and I've retired from that. But I did do some unique jobs while I was in there. I've managed to work across the world. I've worked from the Middle East and I've been seconded into the European Policing Agency and I've dealt with many, many disasters and different type of operations. And I think as I talk about the New Zealand story, you'll see that we are very used to disasters and different things like that. But the second part, the slide on the left, indicates that following my move um, from the police, I have had a full career within the transport sector. I've managed the National Operations Network, I've done things in the design, construction, and optimization of transport. So, so I've had a real uh, in-depth look at that. And then finally, on the top left, I've had a unique perspective in that I'm also a fireman um, in a rural community where I live. So sometimes um, I'm able to see the difference between security and safety and bring that all together in my fire operations. Next slide, please. I'm going to take a short moment to let this slide sink in and what it is it's a demonstration of the roles and functions that the organization I belong to uh, works for so we're a national organization we work right across the country and we sit basically between um, the Ministry of Transport which is the, the key government minister and then the local authorities and in doing that we work with approximately 79 different councils 
If you look at the bottom left, you'll see Waka Katahi's people, and you'll see that actually, I would imagine in comparison to some of, of my colleagues around this, um, this webinar, we're quite small in that we have less than 2,000 people delivering that function. And we're involved in everything. Um, and that's from, um, you know, designing the road network to undertaking the construction, then moving through the maintenance and operations, dealing with our public transport, managing our state highway systems and, and everything in between. And that includes managing uh, the allocation and records of driver's licenses, managing um, the certification of vehicles and setting those regulatory standards so actually when covid came we had much much more of a consideration to think about than just your conventional managing and operating the roads it was very very broad and in actual fact when i was asked to take on that task uh, it was a moment where i needed to take a, a deep breath because of the complexity of the value we had to new zealand next slide please so if we're actually talking about New Zealand, there are some unique things. And I would love to start with a comment that was made from our previous Prime Minister, Sir Geoffrey Palmer. And I think he sums it up very eloquently. And what he says, and I am going to read it, is sometimes it does us a power of good to remind ourselves that we live on two volcanic rocks where two tectonic plates meet in a somewhat lonely stretch of windswept ocean just above the roaring 40s. If you want drama, you've come to the right place. And Next um, uh, slide, please. This is our geographical location and next slide. You'll see that we're basically a long way from anybody else, about 1600 kilometers south of Sydney. That's an important part to COVID because as you can see, our geographical location on that map means that we don't have any land borders with anyone. We're not easily accessible by boat and we're really a long way and our natural isolation somewhat protects us from some of the effects of, of disasters that other countries have. Next slide. Okay, so quick facts. So our population is about 5 million. That's important. Our Prime Minister talks about our COVID response and it being a team of 5 million. There aren't a lot of people in comparison to others. Therefore, um, we don't have the, the huge volumes of and complexity that other countries have. We're a very, very compliant country. And as I talk about our COVID use, I'll give you a demonstration of that. Our landmass is probably just a slightly um, larger than the UK with the third mountainous region. Currently, right now, apart from within our quarantine facilities, we are currently COVID-19 free. We had a, uh, an emergency last week whereby an Australian traveller through our travel bubble had come with the latest Delta variant, but that was very, very rare for us and that was managed very, very quickly. Next slide. We do, however, constantly have an extensive range of natural hazards. This is a snapshot if we could just go back this is a snapshot of where we are right now um you know we've got earthquakes the vehicle there was last week was a, a state of emergency within our area which was a very severe flooding last week the bottom slide uh, the bottom photo on the left there was a tornado that came through and on the bottom right you'll see fires only 24 hours ago we were in a state of emergency because it's the middle of winter here and we had six meter seas. We've got uh, terrible weather. It's the, it's the middle of winter. So we are constantly dealing. And the reason I've shown this is because disasters aren't unusual for us, but COVID was, and we had to think of something different. Next slide, please. So in a, in a very, very small snapshot, next slide, our New Zealand experience is different to anybody else. And there are some key things around that. So this is really our the summary of our timeline. And if you can see, probably about the same time as everybody else, we had the first activation and the first case of COVID-19. But very quickly, you can see on the 14th of May, in effect, we reverted to what I would describe as virtual normality. Yes, we have extensive monitoring and measuring going on and quarantine facilities. But one of the successes around that was because on the 25th of the 3rd, we declared a complete lockdown in the country. Our geographical isolation, our compliant um, uh, culture meant that people 
we were we had a very severe lockdown people were confined in effect to their homes or a very short distance and what that did was eradicate the um eradicate the virus from normal new zealand you would never know really that we are under any type of um covid19 at the moment we just have some very small um uh, measures to to keep that so you would really never know however when next slide when COVID first came, we actually looked and thought, well, what do we have? Um, and we consulted our manual. We operate at the highest level on the left there through our government's strategy, which is the coordinated incident management system. And that talked about how we would establish ourselves and set up. But then when we went into more granular detail of our highways emergency management framework, and then we looked at our standard operating procedures, we actually found that, to be honest, we were very, very light. We didn't have the detail. We didn't know how to manage the intricacies of the day-to-day -day, um, um, management of COVID-19. We had to think very, very differently. Next slide. The one thing that, and the next slide, one thing we did very, very differently this time is that this was our structure. And we follow this, whether it be a severe forest fire, whether it be severe floods, whether tornadoes or whatever, we establish a basic structure. Next slide. This time, we decided to have a different approach to our, how we managed our intelligence and there are reasons for that. If you think I've already described to you that we're a very small country, that means we haven't got you know, infinite resources. We're a small organization of less than 2,000 people. Next slide. So for us, we had to be very, very careful about deploying the resources that we had and making sure that they were in the right place at the right time and doing the right thing. And as a result of that, we decided to really strongly, next slide, invest in our intelligence resources. And that was doing things differently. Essentially, what you needed to do though was understand uh, you know intelligence is around collecting information subjecting it to analysis and then making sure that you make some really really good decisions from it next slide so the first thing we needed to do was identify our intelligence requirements and i'm going to go a little bit more into this next in doing that we, we needed to build a collection strategy it was very very clear with COVID, there was information right across the public sector. There was information all over the government departments internationally, and we were becoming overwhelmed with it. So we needed to decide, okay, what is the strategy? Where are we gonna collect information from? Next, we, um, we were going to devise, next slide please, a, a product suite. A product suite was, well, once we gathered all this information, how would we share it? What were the products they would make? And then the final thing in my next slide is around how we would build resilience in, in certain times. We would build an intelligence team, but how on earth in an unchanging, oh, sorry, in a changing world would we know um, we would need to build in uh, resilience in that? So next, I'm just going to break down some of those components with my remaining five minutes just to very quickly talk about that. So. I think some of the key highlights I'm going to call out is that we had an organization of 2000 people, yet we didn't have an intelligence unit. When we actually looked and we spoke and we looked for volunteers and we sort of made an assessment through our human um, resources records, we actually worked out with that we had about 15 people who had been working in an intelligence um, background. And so so we were completely shocked to understand that we had people with key strengths and training. So the first lesson we learned was use your own people. Um, we just thought we had people who were experienced in engineers and stuff like that. We were shocked to actually understand the depth of our strength from within the group. So we pulled them together. We set our roles and expectations and we allocated um, uh, positions to them. What was really good was that we partnered at the outset and we empowered people and we said, right, do you know what? As groups, you work together, um, find whatever information you can and then analyze it. We pulled in our people with PhDs to do our research. Uh, and it was just very exciting to, to look at the people that we had. The next important thing was our intelligence requirements. And that's the next slide. And these are the most important things is that, um, next slide, please, 
is that understanding what we needed to know, and this just highlights this document here, is that we actually sat down with our decision makers and said, what are the questions you need to be answered? We evaluated the threat, I'll talk about that shortly. We prioritized our assets, as I said, not many people were gonna do with it, what we had, and we decided to narrow the focus in times of crisis. We cut all the noise out and went to the very, very key points. Next slide, please. So within our collection strategy, SANDA in within New Zealand context stands for sources and agencies, and we needed to understand who could help us with that information. Probably the key part from this is just the information overload and making sure that we managed for thousands and thousands of emails and pieces of information that was flying us from left, right and centre. And every local authority or bus company or whatever were, were, were providing us with information and therefore requested it. I think the big learning from this is the bottom point, which is about embedding with partners. And we put our staff members into other government organisations to give us the eyes and ears of what was happening with them. Next slide, please. So the product suite was really important for us. And I think the key learning from this was basically identifying who our customer and our decision making was. And I want to give you this point here, which is sometimes people get caught with the um, with intelligence being some, some form of secrecy and we're not going to talk to people. But the bottom point here is they say knowledge is power. And it really, really is. But knowledge shared is powerful and that's the difference. And we made sure that we had a very good product suite and we used it once. Uh, sorry, we, we prepared our intelligence once and we shared it and shared it and shared it and really empowered people with our knowledge. The next slide, please, is just an example of what we did. The very first thing when COVID arrived was that we did an, an initial threat assessment. I know the slide isn't very clear, but we sat down as a group and we looked at every effect we thought could happen. And as a result of that, next slide, we started to identify some gameplays are, you know, what the, the scenarios could be. And what that did therefore is it enabled us to do some really smart thinking beforehand. And my, um, my final slide is about building resilience. And this would be, um, I suppose this would be for any organization. In a small country, we haven't got a lot of people and people got tired very, very quickly. So we had to build that resilience, obviously boosting confidence. Um, important thing for me is the fact that we put in processes here around designing out failure through peer review and quality assurance. We tested ourselves all the time and we had really good systems and processes to make sure that the intelligence that we were passing to our decision makers was accurate. And if it wasn't, we'd accept that that was wrong. And then finally celebrate success and think actually we've done an operation this time, which was something that we were much more thought out than before. Thank you for listening to my um, my presentation and, and for allowing me to share that with you. Are there any questions? And we will take questions in the chat and we will address those during the question and answer period. So thank you, Neil, appreciate that. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to our next presentation and that's going to be uh, Marcelo Medina. Uh, Marcelo is our Spanish speaking secretary of PR TC 1.5 from Chile. Uh, morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, well, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm Marcelo Medina. I'm the English Spanish Spanish speaking uh, secretary at the uh, PIOC uh, TC 1.5. Uh, I also work at the Ministry of Public Works in Chile at the Road Administration. I'm in charge of the management of the road network. Uh, by our people, by our machinery. So, and also I'm in charge of emergency. So uh, for emergencies for the road administration. Next one, please. Well, my country, it, uh, we have around a uh, hundred, a hundred kilometers, hundred thousand kilometers of road network. Uh, the road administration is a lot of money. <laughs> you see that. Uh, our population, it's uh, 19, uh, 19.5 million, uh, we are divided in 16 regions. We are a republic, so everything is, is, is uh, concentrated in the, in the capital city. Santiago is in the middle of the country. Next one, please. We have a lot of landscapes, a beautiful country, so 
you welcome anytime after this COVID-19. And we open the borders, we are always welcome. And uh, next one, please. But uh, well, there's a beautiful country, very quiet country. <laughs> but uh, on March 2020, the COVID-19 arrived uh, it was in, inevitable, you know. Uh, our first case was in March, uh, March 18. Uh, the, the government declares the catastrophe, you know, restrictive open, the movement, freedom. So we are in curfew since then, till now. And uh, uh, we are going to be until September, September 2021, still in curfew from 22 till 6 a.m. Uh, there's a sanitary customs inter-regional for inter-regional travels. There's a border closure. We still, we, we have the border closure closed. Next one, please. Uh, the big wave came in the May, between May and July, you know, more than a thousand cases per day. It was a, it was a big mess at that time uh, because Nobody knows anything about this 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 disease, this COVID. So everybody was pretty afraid. But in July, in the, we started in autumn, but in July we, we were in winter. The, 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 the cases stabilized in the fifteen hundred around. Next one, please. And everything was concentrated at, at, at the uh, at the uh, at the capital city, at the regional capital city. We call it the uh, metropolitan region. Uh, it concentrates more than uh, six million people in this, this city. You know? So everything was there. But the second wave was in December. We are coming into summertime. So everything was increased. But in February 2021, we started the mass vaccination process. So uh, that was a, a, a relief kind of, but in March, the infections rise until 9,000 cases per day. So 141 dead every, every day. So it was a mess. There was a second big wave. Um, this, this wave was directly related to the end of the year holidays and the summer vacation period because everything was, uh, I think all the restrictions was a little, a little bit late, late laid back, you know, <laughs> so everything uh, was a mess. Uh, next one, please. And you can see the graph here, the first wave and the second wave close to December. Next one, please. But the mass vaccination process start on the first half of 2021, Chile has a a lot of experience, so you can see there the, the schedule for the website on all this, with the schedule with uh, for the people who can go to take the vaccine. We order the vaccine, the vaccine by age and also by the disease condition. It's not disease condition, we call it underlying condition, something like that. And uh, health personnel, of course, was the first. And uh, next one, please. You can see the chart here. Uh, how steep is the slope here? Is the uh, is is the graph here? We started when we reached in two two months two months around more than eight eight million people. So it was pretty fast. Next one, please. And uh, the, 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 in June 2021, we reached eighty thousand. But the target population was over 20 years old. And uh, with disease condition, we are really uh, reaching the 70% of the total population of Chile with the vaccine. Next one, please. But uh, what happened with disaster? We have to talk about disaster. So next one, please. We live. In Chile, Chile is at the edge of the South American uh, continent, you know, close the, with the Nazca plate and the continental plate, the Nazca plate is pressing under 
answer is this uh, continental plate. So, next one, please. We have this kind of shape of Chile, you know? So, when it, it rains up there and then the mountains, next one, happens something like that. You know, this kind of mess. Uh, I love him coming through the, 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 the city there and leave that mess. That, that was in. Uh, 2015. Next one, please. And this one was in 2021, here in the metropolitan region. There's another alluvium. And of course, we have in, during the pandemic, we have in 2019, we have a lot of uh, problems. Now, forest fire, but, but we, we were lucky because we, we, we hadn't uh, any earthquakes, no tsunamis, no. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of things, but um, we did indeed had a, a, an effect on the response stuff uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. The, the, the restrictions imposed by the Ministry of Health is quarantine for people over 16 years with underlying conditions. So the reductions at the peak of it was in June 2020, reached 30% of the people less uh, as, as the response staff. Similar problems at the private sector, the administrative staff. Next one, please. Next one, please. Uh, next one, please. But at the emergency response stage, we keep the staff with the social distancing, with the corresponding uh, element of security, and uh, the performance, the performance of the work was reduced. You can see here the uh, key performance indicator. We have the annual work problem. And you can see in 2020, we had a, 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 a we had a, a, a big difference between the, the other years. You know? So it was, not, it, that, that was the effect on our work. Next one, please. But we have significant changes on the emergency information because the other thing there was, was a project was keep, I don't know why our, our authorities was keeping that project uh, stuck. I, I don't know, I don't know why they didn't want it. But after, after the COVID-19, we have to implement, implement this in two months. So now everybody has the other signature. Now, everybody works from home using all the technology uh, that was available. And, every, and, everybody, and everybody, everybody use it now. So it was easy. Uh, next one. And, uh, and everything happens. We had, um, we had a system, so it was used only by the road administration, but it was thought uh, to you to be used by the whole ministry. So we get that new coordination with these authorities. And uh, now we're using this technology at the, at the at ministerial level. Uh, next one, please. This is our closed source formation for growth emergency in, emergency in Chile. You can see this kind of uh, records with and everything. No. Next one, please. Mm. Everything is goes on the map. That is uh, on the website of the road administration. Next one, please. And you can see clicking on that uh, point, you can see the detailed information. No. This is available for, 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 for the public in general. No. Next one, please. Uh, this system is part of a, another big, big, uh, uh, asset uh, enterprise asset management world class uh, system. So uh, it, it, it also involves next one, please. The management of the road, we have the storage management, the purchase management, machinery, maintenance management, everything. So that's just another model. So next one, please. So we have a lot of people trained to. to uh, to record the information. Next one, please. Uh, we also have our road network digitalized in a, in a unique database. 
So we can do a lot of things with this information. Next one, please. We can map the work orders instead. That's an example. Uh, for, for road maintenance, what we done, and that's the, 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 the information. Next one, please. But this have a problem because it's exclusive for the for, for us for, for the MP for the Ministry of Public uh, Works agents. Uh, uh, it is now collecting detailed information. It's a technical problem with mobile signal required, of course. Next one, please. But what we do, we improve now with this impulse that we have with the COVID, with the COVID in, in information, we impose that and uh, we are working now improving the data collection uh, for the close uh, source information uh, with that safe record during the lack of signal, of course, and it's easy to use and everything. You know? So this is something that we, uh, that we require. Next one. Also, we think in the just uh, we, we are doing something that it's simple for collect information. Next one, please. We can use the citizens, of course. Next one, please. And and develop an open source of information. Next one, please. And we also are creating now an open source of information to use the citizens uh, with this information. So. At the end, next one, please. <clears throat> Our next challenge will be how to manage this closed source and this open source together in order to take more information and uh, of course, manage this information as we require. Next one, please. So, the impact of the pandemic at the end related to information was an impulse for us. Uh, we passed from digitalization to digitalization process. Uh, now we take, in order to take the best possible measures and inform our users. Uh, we also, we look for a more efficient way to collect information in all the cycles of the, of the emergency uh, with all technology we have available. And uh, we improve the coordination with, between our stakeholders with this digital, digitalization pro, uh, process. Now, uh, everything is done through the system uh, related with information, with emergency information. Work. And uh, it's been, uh, uh, as, as, I, as I wrote, uh, uh, reduce the stress <laughs> among the stakeholders and make the operation very, very efficient. Next one, please. Thank you very much. All right, thanks so much, Marcelo. Greatly appreciate the presentation. So next up will be Harry Vaza. Harry is our member of PRC TC 1.5 from Indonesia. Go ahead, Harry. Thank you, Chris. Next, please. My name is uh, Harry Baza. I am a director of road construction, uh, Ministry of Public Work and Housing, Indonesia. Next, please. Here, I would like to share about Indonesian experience on managing disaster affected to the road sector, particularly in COVID-19 pandemic. Mostly will be about the disaster itself and effect of the COVID on managing disaster on the road sector. And the last, I would like to highlight the lesson learned and what can we do in the future. Next slide, please. Talking about the disaster management cycle, it is common divided into four cycles. First is mitigation, aim to reduce any disaster risk in case in public work and housing. Uh, we will implement a building code for certain infrastructure. Second one is the preparedness, aim to increase alertness to a disaster. So if another disaster strike happen, we can be prepared and ready. Third one is the emergency response, 
we did identify the impact of the disaster as soon as possible. Task force in it repeat, have to survey and report the impact and handling matters. Fourth, rehabilitation and re reconstruction, including data monitoring and application and reporting of the rehabilitation and re reconstruction, which is included in the disaster response program. Here I would like to highlight on the cycle three and cycle four in this occasion. Next slide, please. The earthquake in Manuju in Majene on January 14 and 15, 2021, it is our first case in COVID pandemic. The earthquake struck with magnitude of 5.9 of and 6.2 respectively. Both earthquake created massive interruption on traffic line and cut off any transportation access and also cost landslide in some places along as long 20 kilometer road. Based on the data published on January 19, this earthquake uh, caused more than 20,000 people with almost 1,200 people injured and 90 people dead. Next slide, please. Another case is the Saroja tropical cyclone that struck East Nusa Tegara on April 7, 2021, and also created terrifying storm with high rainfalls, lightning, and strong wind within radius 150 up to 200 kilometer. Saroja cyclone was the second so strongest cyclone in Indonesia. The cyclone was powerful enough to cause 300 millimeter extreme rainfalls per day and 34 kilometer cannot hurricane at capital city. The flood were everywhere due to the high rainfalls and the cyclone caused a number of regions in East Nusa Tenggara province. According to the National Disaster Management Agency, as April 9, the cyclone has caused 208 people dead. Next, please. We can see, next, please. We can learn where both disaster create huge impact on the road sector, which cause harder evacuation process because of road and bridge were unusable. In this road uh, sector play, an important role in providing help for evacuation team on a uh, two-minute uh, to the damaged areas. Building infrastructure failure varies from broken, broken column, crack in building, and even sliding on the foundation. This could be unpreferable either to the bike team nor to the government. When this problem is not fixed, this could be created in another disaster due to the aftershock, which is occasionally bigger in magnitude. Next slide, please. When disaster occur, an official letter is issued by the government to declare an emergency status or level. When this de declaration is approved, disaster management action plan can be issued for emergency response and post disaster plan. The, the standard quick response during emergency response cycle is to mobilize the heavy construction equipment from nearest a project to the image area to help mix road network clear and open and can be used for rescuing the victim as well as for logistics. Next slide, please. This slide is an example, of the letter of state, the disaster event from the governor to declare the emergency status of the Mamuju Majene earthquake and consider as the national disaster. Next, please. After the disaster happened, governor issued a letter about level of status of the event. And after that, emergency response team is formed 
aim to conduct day by day evaluation and verification of the field condition. And next, uh, rescuing a victim and wiping out the debris from the road. And central government set post disaster management task force in order to coordinate disaster management countermeasure. This emergency response activity are funded by the reserve fund on the highway sector through budget revision proposed by the emergency response work unit. Next, please. The research camp for disaster emergency response team is established and this must be located at the strategic location where easily to access by the community and relatively safe for another impact. The camp is provided with a standard house facility while imp implemented health and COVID-19 protocol. Next slide, please. The recovery piece. The main object is the, to restore and recover infrastructure and environment back to normal as possible. National Disaster Management Agency, as well as a public work and housing, can propose an additional budget for emergency response and post disaster to national uh, research budget. The implementation is carried out in staging over three years fiscal three fiscal years. Next, please. Here is the, an exam, example of the budget for reconstruction of the road sector, which they meet by the earthquake. We can see here the detail and how much the allocation needed with target of work about 12.25 kilometers in the year 2021, as well as a rec reconstruction budget for next year. Next slide, please. Uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic, there are some difficulties in managing and overcoming the impact of the disaster. In emergency response phase, the government readily respond to rescuing the victim and keep them at a separate location through a quick response team, which is located in the uh, local government level while waiting the national support. The main activity of the emergency response is digging up for remaining bodies who are covered by ruin, while another team, including public works team, are working to clear and make road ready to be used for evacuation. In the case of the Momoju and Manjani earthquake case, there are some challenges to implement the COVID 19 safety protocol especially when the rescue team is undertaking the responsibility to rescue and to rescue the victim. There are only few number of happy construction equipment in Mamuju Majene area. It is also difficult to find operator due to the trip interruption as well as the shortage of the fuel in Mamuju may cause the happy equipment works less optimum. Next slide, please. In the recovery phase began uh, soon after response uh, cycle has uh, settled, the government start to manage what need to be done permanently on the road sector by creating task force, which is a task force activity starting from searching and investigating the damage due to the disaster and searching what action need to be taken to improve or fixing and prevent, prevent, prevent them from happening again in the future. The difficulty space during the pandemic is the supply and change of the material, availability of uh, heavy construction equipment, and also issue fuel to some restriction in transportation applied by the government in COVID-19 pandemic. Next. Slide, please. Uh, regarding the management of COVID-19, a Minister of Public Work and Housing is struck uh, that in every project has responsible always to implementing 
COVID-19 prevention protocol. By washing hands, wearing masks, implementing physical and social distancing. Uh, on the right hand is uh, our president, on the left hand is uh, our minister. In the center is the chief of the disaster National Disaster Management Agency. Next, please. Along with the construction of the platform activity while COVID-19 COVID pandemic, public work and housing is also issuing ministerial instruction. Number, 20, number two, 2020, it is a one year ago, regarding the prevention protocol for COVID-19 in construction services. This rule regulate about a procurement process as much as by online. The second one is the changing in specification is a law. And third one is a temporary suspended, suspend of contract works when the worker impacted by the COVID. Next, please. Our minister of public works commit to complete infrastructure development to maintain sustainability of economic activity. The minister itself stated that uh, all region of peace of public work and housing must prepare for natural disaster that can be occur anytime, especially during COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We must continue to protect road and bridges so that the logistic line does not cut off when disaster uh, happen. Next, please. Listen, learn. From all the disaster we have experienced, the result from each disaster evaluation become good listen learn. From emergency response pace, a quick response is very critical to open road for evacuation, logistic delivery and, or, and also rescue team. Mobilization of heavy construction equipment from nearest projects are very important to accelerate to open the road. It is also very important to make full support and inspire it to the old staff member and family who works for the highway regional office, which is impacted by the disaster before having support from nearest highway regional office. When the, uh, we need or to uh, organize the bike team living in temporary shelter, to ensure COVID-19 safety protocol are implemented, such as making group family in uh, making uh, a group according uh, family member and putting divider if necessary. As soon as a situation has settled, government start to identify any priority which is needed to be taken. One of the first thing to do is creating a task force, especially to conduct disaster investigation, which look at the cause and what need to be considered to mitigate similar event happen in the future. Pay attention should be given to seismic and geological parameters during recovery and descent process, as another disaster may happen in the future. For example, we need to consider location of the fall, slide, and underwater stream, and so on. Next, please. It is, a, it is important to shifting to digital transformation by integrating several applications from different agencies and ministry in order to have comprehensive and accurate information on an, any disaster event, risk-based digital map which overlay the infrastructure become with uh, seismic and geological parameters should be on should be on the hand to determine risk mitigation measure. Furthermore, digitization infrastructure condition database can be accessed remotely is important and can be as basis for promulgating mitigation strategies. Some on ongoing example is a prone landslide map, prone plot map, activity mountain uh, mountainous monitoring. Next, please. 
successful integration into agency information is key issue and crucial. Therefore, good coordination among ministry and agency are important. We have a main agency dealing with the, uh, the, 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 the disaster. When this uh, success, accurate information may be available. Mitigation and strategy in handling in, in, the, in the disaster can be achieved optimally. Integrating uh, interagency coordination for better disaster management include integration information such as a line, landslide, volcano, and seismic data, a satellite imaginary data, rainfall data, root network map, and root infrastructure database, and also construction services uh, database. With such condition, when disaster occur, government can easily decide on handling as quickly as, quickly as possible and accurately. Next, please. In addition to integrated interagency information, integration within root infrastructure database is also crucial for use in disaster management. There are several existing database databases as well as new that new needed to be integrated, such as a current project engagement, root network map, disaster prone area, existing root and breed asset management. By disintegrating, the information become accurate to help those needed. Next, please. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Harry. Greatly appreciate that and appreciate uh, all the presentations from our PRC members. So we're going to, uh, to now move into our presentations by our TRB members. So we'll start with uh, Janet Benini. Welcome, Janet. Thank you, Chris. I'm Janet Benini from the United States. I'm a longtime emergency manager who specializes in transportation. I'm really pleased to be with you here today and to be part of this really interesting webinar. In the United States, we have about 360 million people and about 33 million of us have been sick with COVID, of whom about 600,000 people have died. We've been vaccinating folks since February and now about 55% of our population is vaccinated. The greatest impediment to increasing this number is the hesitancy to take the vaccine. At the peak, about 300,000 new cases were diagnosed daily. And even now there were over 10,000 new cases just yesterday. Next please. During the pandemic, I was part of a small team that was challenged to develop a playbook, an operational guide for transportation organizations. Our team read everything we could get our hands on. We participated in webinars and we interviewed key leaders of state transportation departments and public transportation organizations, large and small, urban and rural throughout the United States. We're really excited about the lessons that we discovered and how innovative and resilient transportation organizations and the communities they work in have proven to be. Our job was to put it all together in a way that could be used by others. Next, please. First of all, and as some of my colleagues have explained so well today, pandemics are different. We transportation people are pretty familiar with natural disasters, but there's some real differences with pandemics. Instead of just one big event and then the aftermath, like with an earthquake or a hurricane, the timeline of a pandemic can be very long. The impacts are different too, as infrastructure like facilities and equipment tends not to be damaged, but employees, families, and communities experience a great impact and the economy, not only of the area, but the whole country can be victimized. Some roles were contracted. Ridership of public transit fell dramatically and remains very reduced. 
as does airline usage. While other roles expand, such as using transportation facilities as testing centers or transportation systems for protective equipment or vaccine distribution. Next slide, please. And as we've learned, and as we've learned even today, the pandemic has impacted different communities at different times. And sometimes after a lull, there's another spike. Transportation organizations need to have a menu of possible actions and be prepared to implement them and to end them when caseloads change. Regional Transfer, Transit Denver was thinking ahead. And here we see some examples of their work. Early on, they defined phases and what to do in each phase, including action to take, what to monitor, and how to evaluate. Next slide. One thing that we've learned is important is build on what you know. Don't think you have to start from scratch. Next. Nearly every organization has some sort of emergency plan. Some of the transportation groups that we spoke to had pandemic plans and they provided a good starting point, but in some cases they were outdated or based on the wrong assumptions. Many organizations found that their continuity or COOP plans came in handy, and some even relied on their cybersecurity plans, especially as they began having many employees telework. So don't think you have to start from scratch with the pandemic. Yes, it's different, but at least some aspects of the plans you have should still apply. You may want to have a couple discussion exercises with what if type scenarios so your team can talk through what you would do in various situations. Next, please. Transportation people have had an amazing can do attitude. The agencies already have the muscles and the tools to adapt, and they already have a heart for the community. Agencies have expedited existing processes and broken down silos to adapt to the pandemic. According to one transit official we talked with, if you'd asked how long would it take to make a major route change, the pre-pandemic response might have been, oh, a year maybe, but now we've done it in a week. Next, please. One thing we've learned is there's no such thing as over communicating. In fact, communicate more often and in more different ways than you probably think is necessary. People are stressed out during a pandemic and they have a hard time processing information. Make your message simple and clear and tell them multiple times in different ways. Next, please. Communicate with your staff regularly and try to be flexible as they adjust, not only to changed work, but also to changed family demands. Make sure your policies are clear and the employees understand why they've been put in place. As the policies evolve, communicate the changes. And remember, communications is two ways. Find ways to gather questions and input. For example, the Maryland Mass Transit Administration uses the safety hotline, which is originally for employees and contractors to report possible safety violations for pandemic related concerns and feedback. It's become so popular that employees from other departments started calling that number too. Most employees are willing to give more than usual if they feel the system is fair and flexible to meet their other needs. Next, please. As we've all seen, public health guidance changes from time to time and people get confused. Make sure you communicate in many different ways what you expect of your passengers. Let them know what you're doing for their safety and also what's required of them. Say it in many different ways, in different languages, 
and include graphics to be consistent and clear. Next, please. One of the challenges of the transportation com community has been how to sustain operations. Here are some insights from our playbook. Next. The challenges are different from other emergencies because the hazard is new to most people and invisible. There's more fear and a loss of confidence and safety. Employees may be impacted personally, either by becoming sick, having sick family members, assuming new responsibilities as children can't go to traditional schools, or having family income reduced through pay cuts and layoffs. Agencies can help by being flexible and as transparent as possible. People need people, and the lack of interaction among work teams can impact morale. Customers are also impacted and mask wearing reduces facial expressions and warmth. Find ways to help people get through this. The pandemic, especially as time goes on, results in stress and psychological impacts for many people. Agencies can help through publicizing resources to help their employees, family members, and customers. Due to economic restrictions, Many organizations lose funding, which may result in job cuts and insecurity for staff. Agencies can help by potentially deferring some expenditures, tapping additional revenue streams, economizing operations, and, as, and being as transparent as possible with employees about what's being done and what can be expected. And remember, actions that address or solve one problem may inadvertently create or exacerbate another. Agencies can help by staying alert, nimble, and creative. Next slide. Transportation has been called upon to do many new things or in new ways. On the low tech side, our messaging signs help spread the word about public health policies. Our ongoing newsletters have been expanded in distribution and content to allow more people to know what transportation was doing to protect and serve them. And we also expanded our cap capabilities, including distributing food and supplies. Higher tech, and as one of my colleagues mentioned on this webinar, New technology has been used like Zoom or Microsoft Meetings. New routing and changing tools allowed agencies to be much more responsive to changing traffic patterns. And apps for customers to anticipate crowded buses and decide whether to wait or when the next bus would arrive and anticipate how crowded it might be. Transportation has better integrated with community services. We're networking with things for we're, we're networking for with them for things like food distribution, Wi-Fi connections, closing lanes of traffic so restaurants could expand outdoor services and other things. We've used our assets to deliver essential supplies, equipment, and medical support. We helped locate vaccination sites and testing sites based on traffic issues and provided traffic management around them. Sometimes we even used our own transportation facilities as testing or vaccination sites. Next slide. The pandemic has led to a new type of essential worker, not just doctors and nurses, but the people who clean the hospital, staff the grocery store, drive the produce trucks, and operate the city buses. How can we better take care of these groups? For example, in Oakland, California, they learned that closing lanes to help restaurants sometimes jeopardize these essential workers by exposing them to more congestion. So they had to pivot and make sure they took care of safety too. 
Communities are learning to map out food deserts where groceries are not available, for example, and Wi-Fi deserts. Wi-Fi has become much more important during the pandemic. And transportation has helped fill those gaps, either by expanding bus routes or even using buses as Wi-Fi hubs. In each of our countries, there are poor people and those underserved by government programs. COVID in the US has hit these populations especially hard. We encourage transportation agencies to be especially alert to this problem. So adjustments to services and schedules can be made to lessen the impact. Next, please. So what happens next? Next, please. This pandemic has already gone on for more than a year with no real end in sight. People are tired of it and responders are exhausted. Find ways to give your employees an opportunity to take a break and recharge so they'll be there for you in the long run. And as some of the previous presenters pointed out, we know natural disasters aren't gonna stop just because there's a pandemic. In the US, we've had large wildfires and several hurricanes or cyclones during COVID. We've had to adapt our plans and systems, especially for evacuations and sheltering. Involve your staff in contingency planning. Many times they offer good ideas based on their experience and insights. Next slide. So we need to recognize that this pandemic is a big deal. It's a significant event in all of our lives, something we will never forget. Some of us were sick and may have lost lasting symptoms. Others lost friends or family members. Some had to work through the pandemic, jeopardizing their health to provide essential services to others. In the US, bus operators were sickened at a much higher rate than the general public. Others worked from home and had to deal with competing priorities of children out of school or relatives needing assistance. Many families lost income. Our stress levels are up and so is alcohol and drug use. Your staff may have been impacted in these and other ways that you may never even know about. Be kind, be considerate of others and be tolerant of differences as we ease back into the new normal. Next, please. The person who has your job next isn't going to know what you know now. Do what you can to help them for the next time something like this occurs. Review your emergency plans. Consider how innovations from the pandemic, like remote work, might help you in other situations. Document what didn't go well, as well as what did. Both help the next time decisions have to be made. And make an action plan for improvements. Get top level buy-in. Come up with a limited number of priorities, assign responsibilities and timelines, and make sure the top level follows up to make sure things are implemented. Next, please. In many ways, the pandemic was a transformative moment. Management listened to employees and clients more than usual. Employer and employee relationships in many organizations improved as everyone worked towards the same goals. Innovation was rapid and extensive. This involved taking risks and making course corrections as needed. Let's try to remain to maintain some of these silver linings as we move out of the critical phase of this pandemic. Next, please. The pandemic playbook for transportation agencies has been downloaded thousands of times. It was distributed by NATO to 30 different countries in the NATO Alliance and is now being translated into Chinese. 
Bill Anderson posted the link to the website. This is not a long or academic tome. This is a practical, user-friendly, operational guide. These are the email addresses of our team. I'm Janet Benini. Please contact us for more information and to let us know your ideas so we can continue to improve our playbook. And thank you, Pyrac, for making this opportunity available to talk with you. All right, thank you so much, Janet. Greatly appreciate that. We're gonna continue right on here and move into uh, Dana Hendricks's presentation. Dana is a member of TRB's AMR10 Standing Committee on Critical Transportation Infrastructure Protection and also AMR20, the Standing Committee on Disaster Response, Emergency Evacuations and Business Continuity. The microphone's yours, Dana. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone here in California. Chris, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Oh, thank you so much. So thank you for the nice introduction. It's a pleasure to speak with you here today. Next slide, please. Caltrans mission is to provide a safe and reliable transportation network that serves all people. Over 39 people live here in California and respects the environment. The department manages more than 50,000 miles or over 80,000 kilometers of California's highway and freeway lanes, encompassing over 250 state highways with more than 12,000 bridges and over 20,000 employees. Caltrans has six primary programs, highway transportation, mass transportation, transportation planning, aeronautics, administration, and our equipment service center. I'm gonna spend a few minutes today talking about my work in our Caltrans Department Operations Center or DOC over the past 15 months. I'll speak similarly to the past presenters about lessons learned um, as our DOC manages compounding emergencies of COVID-19, wildfires, wildfire smoke, public safety power shutoff or PSPS, as well as recovery efforts from wildfires California experienced in 2019 and 2020. Next slide, please. The uh, emergency management circle of engagement explained by Harry in his presentation with safety in the center as our number one goal guides Caltrans emergency management through thick and thin. Emergencies are of course unknown. We never fully realize when we're in the throes of initial response what or who will be precisely needed or exactly where the emergency will take us. It's through our preparedness and mitigation that our response and recovery can have a firm, calm footing that it needs to be effective. As Janet just said, COVID was not a typical emergency for transportation people. Caltrans Headquarters Communication Center, or HQCOM, sends out road closure information twice a day to department staff. On it is listed slides, slide removals, closure information having to do with flooding, snow, wildfire, adverse weather, but there's no mention of pandemic. Our Caltrans response to COVID and the ensuing compounding incidents that occurred was all based on an all hazard approach. We relied on strong communication skills, partnerships and plans that the department had worked on and built up during the past decade. Next slide, please. So one of our first actions, similar to what Neil described as a threat assessment, was understanding the potential COVID-19 risks facing the department's 22,000 staff members and identifying those essential public services the department provides. We did this through the use of what Janet had termed our COOP, which was Caltrans Continuity of Operations Plan, as well as we had a department pandemic influenza response plan and we also used information from the United States Center for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC. Also, fortunately, as other, uh, other members in their presentation have noted, we had very strong internal partnerships, uh, those being with our own Caltrans Office of Health and Safety. So Caltrans COOP plan uh, with pandemic information from the CDC contained those elements such as prioritized essential functions, continuity of facilities that included pre-staging of equipment and materials, internal and external functional dependencies, and lines of succession. 
COVID-19 safety requirements for social distancing, personal protective equipment or PPE use, and disinfection concerns led us into a virtual environment, which Marcelo eloquently spoke about for Caltrans DOC, as well as the 12 emergency operation centers or EOCs that our staff uses throughout the state, a first for the department. Next slide, please. So here's a picture of our vacant dot with the chairs wearing the vests instead of the staff and a smoke map from Caltrans Emergency Common Operational Picture or MCOP. Strong internal partnerships within our department from maintenance, planning, traffic and modal operations, IT, health and safety and public affairs enabled us to swiftly set up needed tools such as computers, internet connections cell phones and printers at home so that staff from those departments could quickly work virtually in the dock on the emergency at hand. We had previously prepared checklists for wildfire and PSPS, time-saving documents that organized our preparedness, saved time, and built efficiency into our operations. To answer Yolandi's question, yes, we relied on virtual web tools, um, specifically our Caltrans MCOT GIS dashboard that contain continuously updated maps with California's fire smoke forecasts, active fires, COVID-19 impacts, Caltrans assets with hydrologic and geotechnical data, as well as our partner map from Cal OES, National Weather Service, and critical to our response to PSPS, power company electrical outage maps. These tools enabled our virtual environment or environments to effectively respond to the compounding emergencies and also maintain a reporting structure, which is so important to keep our Caltrans executives informed of daily emergency operations. We learned also that in order to take care of multiple events happening at the same time, we had to have separate virtual operations. So we had two docs set up, one just specifically for COVID and the other for wildfires, wildfire smoke and PSPS. COVID-19 of course was the underlying emergency, continues to be as Janet had pointed out, and it was activated each and every day for over 250 days in a row while the other virtual environment was activated as needed. One of our emergency operation centers in Northern California tested a virtual drop-in anytime EOC, a web camera that was an instant connection with their EOC staff. At the dock, I would leave an audio connection open at times during our activation so anybody could speak up and I would hear them and could then respond as if they were in the same room. Of course, being at home, there were a few sounds of daily life that did impinge, but being able to quickly respond greatly outweighed those concerns and spontaneous audio interruptions. Next slide, please. Vulnerable populations. As Janet spoke about during her presentation, in each of our countries, there are underserved and poor people who were hit especially hard by COVID. The California Department of Social Services established Project Room Key, recognizing that vulnerable people may, who may call home underneath a highway overpass or outside near California's transportation system may be exposed to or recovering from COVID. This social service response provides emergency hotel rooms for people who are experiencing homelessness and also serves as a pathway off of Caltrans, or California's, I should say, transportation system and into permanent housing. Next slide, please. In the first few months of COVID-19, certain tasks the department undertakes were happening much faster than usual, such as the progression of construction projects on less congested highways and the quick use of electronic forms for the department. What was also progressing faster than usual was the use of PPE. We were concerned about the quantity and the ability to quickly prepare, procure PPE for Caltrans staff. Typically, Caltrans is the department that the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, or Cal OES, mission tasks to assist other departments. But in this COVID-19 environment, we did what I would call a reverse mission task. We asked Cal OES for assistance and fortunately they were able to send us PPE items required for our department's response. Next slide, please. So during our compounding responses, we were also mission tasked 
to assist another agency with debris recovery operations from previous wildfire events. Caltrans staff that we normally rely on to deploy out to the field to assist with debris operations were unable to because of COVID concerns or workload responsibilities. We learned that we could ask the entire department staff, over 22,000 employees for assistance with wildfire recovery and staff responded. We had hundreds of texts, voicemails, emails from staff willing to go over and above to assist with recovery operations. I've personally heard from toll collectors, field superintendents, planners, engineers, architects, research analysts, legal health and safety staff, to name just a few. We also use this communication as a knowledge transfer, speaking to staff about Caltrans role in emergency management for their information, but also to spread this information to their work team. I even heard from retired staff and staff from other agencies who wanted to help out. We were then able to send personnel to fill the need with the lesson learned being that when asked to help, our staff said, how can I help and where am I needed? Next slide, please. So long-term resilient strategies. Uh, Caltrans is building back better. Projects in our state are building in redundancies which serve to make the highways more resilient. A couple of projects that have been completed in the last six months of redundant features that will substantially improve water flow capacity for future storms. One project in particular has been designed for both a hundred year event and a combination of events. A large scale wildfire similar to one that occurred near that transportation infrastructure and also a, lane, a large rain event. We're also looking to the future towards early warning, wildfire technology, sensors, both in the field and on satellites. Caltrans continues to use eco-friendly technology as well. Goats transported to a site full of vegetation that may fuel or a potential wildfire on state right-of-way are able to create a fantastic fire break and effortlessly do what they do best, eat almost everything in sight. So next slide, please. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. All right, thank you so much, Dave. I appreciate that. So next up, we'll have Chelsea Trebaniak, member of TRB's AMR10 Standing Committee on Critical Transportation Infrastructure Protection. Chelsea. Thank you, Chris, and hello, everyone. I want to echo the comments of my colleagues. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us all today. We really have enjoyed presenting a lot of information and look forward to answering, answering your many questions. Slide, please. My name is Chelsea Trebaniak, and I'm the owner of Critical Ops, where we specialize in modernization. So we bring legacy systems and mindsets to the current and focus on the future. This includes processes, technology, and human-centric interactions. Relevant to today, I'm the principal investigator for NCHRP 20-124, which is the Deploying Transportation Security Practices in State DOT's project. I'm also an ACRP ambassador and a member of the AMR 10 Critical Infrastructure Committee. I get the luxury to serve on several panels specific to transformative technologies, strategic planning, and communication tactics. Slide, please. In the webinar today, we explored a variety of responses and several research findings. Specifically speaking to the prior two presenters, Dana and Janet, I want to specifically address how to connect research to some of these practical examples. So Janet addressed the need to over-communicate, document everything, build relationships, and innovate despite challenges that COVID presented. Meanwhile, Dana demonstrated how innovative thinking can result in initiatives that bring together government and private sector partners to identify technologies that meet first responders' operational needs, ensuring the nation's critical infrastructure remains secure and resilient. These opportunities demonstrate how we can shift an overwhelmingly negative situation like COVID into an event that helps us grow. It is noteworthy when science provides a recommendation extensive testing occurs within controlled environments, and when implemented, communities are the direct beneficiary. Slide, please. 
So what if we could replicate success, plan for the unknown, and share lessons learned before a disaster? Question yourself. Would you be willing to sharpen your abilities for the tasks at hand or increase a capability by preemptively refining a process? What about security? Would you be willing to reduce the potential for fraud and error by incorporating technology? In many, cancer, in many answers, the resounding answer is yes. And research shows that 98% of business enterprises expect to gain value by doing just some of these actions. However, 68% cite that implementation barriers are justification for a lack of follow through. Slide please. So what are these implementation barriers? They are challenges rooted in a variety of causes. Some examples include key stakeholders, budget limitations, a lack of resources, or a lack of clarity in guidelines, roles, and responsibilities. It could be one, several, or other items not identified in this brief list. Regardless, there needs to be a way to preemptively identify those barriers to implementation so we can generate the outcomes we desire. Slide, please. And this is where training and exercises come into play. Training and exercises allow personnel from senior officials to frontline workers an opportunity to explore capabilities in a realistic, and risk-free environment while demonstrating community resolve to prepare for a major incident. Collaboration and training in the exercise environment is an opportunity to objectively assess capabilities and address implementation barriers I previously noted. Actions can be taken preemptively as opposed to reactively. Knowing the value in training and exercises, it's important to address the elephant in the room, time. Training and exercises take time, time to develop, time to coordinate, and even time to facilitate. Therefore, it's important to select which type of training or exercise maximize available time for both the planning team and the participants. Planners can select a discussion-based exercise or an operational-based exercise. The selection then determines the facilitation and helps develop the content. Slide, please. For this particular exercise that I'm going to address, we ran and facilitated it during the TRB annual meeting in 2021. We selected a discussion-based exercise for a multitude of reasons. Communication and relationships. The TRB annual meeting was held virtually and required a planning team members as well as global participants given the range of pandemic responses as well as time constraints. Documentation and innovation. Virtual delivery of exercises was relatively new in January 2021. Many folks were and continue to be inundated by the capabilities in the virtual space. Gathering and providing relevant documentation was a necessity to keep planners informed and participants engaged in this new environment. Slide, please. Once we selected the type of exercise, the content came next. Reverting back to January, many folks were lacking clarity from multiple professional and personal angles. The pandemic, the pandemic monopolized all conversations, leaving us vulnerable to attack and susceptible to greater devastation from natural and compound disasters. Given this risk, it was imperative that we motivate conversations beyond the pandemic. Our planning endeavors were empowered by assumptions. Assumptions allow for planning beyond the known, which is the case when it came to moving beyond the pandemic. A favorable scenario that was considered is a case-by-case -case impact analysis. Individuals considered their situations, including their own professional and personal lives. In this situation, the focus was on balance. With shutdowns and daily changes, individual decision matrices drove actions. When introducing an unfavorable scenario, the complexity increased. An unfavorable situation included a natural disaster specific to a geographical area. Hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires, and excessive heat caused emergency responses, and many folks explain that today. Geography and jurisdictional guidelines drove action 
or in some case, lack thereof. Finally, the worst case scenario. Compound disasters were linked to natural disasters I just mentioned. In these cases, supply chain disruption, national widespread demonstrations, and workforce complications tested our crisis management capabilities and strategies for sustainability. Slide, please. With these scenarios in mind, we created INJEX. For this exercise, and given the broad, broad range of participants, we focused on four overarching categories for INJEX. They were sheltering, emergency evacuation, decision-making, and security. Injects range from separation within the shelter due to social distancing requirements, conflicting guidance, and the data necessary to advance planning initiatives. At all times, security was a strong consideration. Slide, please. The actual exercise was facilitated on January 22nd, 2021. The results were just amazing. Breakout groups via Zoom were very lively and roundtable conversations to separate the favorable, unfavorable, and worst case scenarios highlighted several critical lessons learned and created guidance to empower the next day and months to follow. Specific highlights of this endeavor led to refined visuals, exercise artifacts, and fictitious yet very realistic reading materials to expand on the exercise contents. All attendees received a situation manual and a detailed after action report to formulate an improvement plan centric to their individual through enterprise needs. I especially wanna highlight the wide range of participation, which continues to grow as our security project continues. We celebrate contributions from four countries, 41 states, 156 organizations, and 12 industries. Slide, please. Insights have culminated in a roadmap led by two interdependent deployment strategies that are underpinned by three enabling change management techniques. Enterprises are empowered to identify a starting point for implementation of the strategies. The security implementation tool is a 20 minute self-assessment capable of creating this starting point. Supporting parameters and toolkits create opportunities for understanding and growth at the enterprise, program, project and activity levels. Slide, please. As I share this experience with you, we are actively addressing unique transportation challenges, many of which stem from the pandemic. For example, the departments of transportation rely on over 450 information systems to carry out their missions. However, departments face challenges in strengthening oversight to address longstanding cybersecurity weaknesses and risks. Part of the oversight shortage specifically comes from an overall workforce shortage. Mm -hmm. In the US, transportation and transportation related industries employ over 13.3 million people and only account for 9.1% of workers. Unfortunately, this number reflects a decline that began in 1990. Financial learning. shortfalls. Pressures on organizations during this pandemic have shifted from moving <laughs> citizens <laughs> And if I can kindly ask, there's a hot mic out there, if you can just kindly mute. Going back to that point, just the financial shortfalls that have shifted from keeping core transportation systems operational with the skeleton workforce and ensuring that freight and key essential workers can actually move. And finally, a secondary impact of the pandemic is the sudden change in sources of revenue, not only for the transportation enterprise, but also for those operators. Many solutions to these challenges are evolving, and we're currently in phase two of this 30-month research project, where it is our goal to address the challenges and expose the security community to solutions. We are facilitating regional, multi-state, and national level events that culminate in a workshop in Washington, DC on the 1st of November. Your participation is encouraged and highly welcomed. So please, I've got my contact information on the slide, send me a note, give me a call. I'd love to get you incorporated. And again, I thank you for your time. And at this point, I'll turn it back over to Chris for closing comments. All right, thank you, Chelsea. Appreciate that. So, uh, and thanks again to all of our presenters for excellent materials that they've shared with us today. So 
We're gonna now move into our question and answer session. So again, if you, if you would use the chat function to ask your questions. Also, please identify which speaker your question is directed to. So I have several questions that have come in. So I'm gonna go ahead and start uh, with Neil. So the first question is, is there any complexity of regulations that were made by New Zealand governments which confused the public society for COVID-19 awareness? Um, ooh, great question. Uh, what I would say is that um, I think one of the successes of the country was around very clear alert levels. And to be fair, um, what we did, well, I say we, what the New Zealand government did is I think they announced the legislative framework and the rules under which we operate very early in the piece and then clearly communicated them. And apart from on a couple of points, they never changed. So the conditions were set in the outset. Everybody knew the rules and... Um, it was clearly communicated. It didn't leave much for ambiguity. Of course, the situation does change and there have been things that have been problematic, but on the whole, the framework was set and that's what we ran with for the whole duration. I hope that answers in some way what the question was. All right, thank you very much, appreciate that. And I've got several questions for different panel members, so I'm gonna kind of uh, intermingle them here. So I'm gonna jump to Marcelo. Uh, there was a question, what has been the effects of vaccination against COVID-19 in, in Chile? Well, vaccination has been very fast. Uh, we are applying, we are reaching almost 67% of the population, but we still not reach the, um, uh, as I said, this level of immunity, you know, uh, we still don't have it, but uh, we also have uh, resistance of the for for the vaccination, you know, of the young people. I don't know why. It's a, it's a kind of fashion, I think, you know. But um, now the the government uh, uh, has a, a, a new strategy. Of course, we have uh, the people who have has two doses uh, has more uh, less restrictions. Let's say some in order to. Uh, improve or, or, or make the people go to, to take the vaccine, they shut, you know? But we still not feeling the, 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 the results of the, of the vaccination process. All right, thank you, Marcelo, appreciate that. And this is a question that uh, really is directed to all of our panel members. And it's, how did COVID-19 affect ongoing road construction projects? Uh, did you continue those construction sites or close them? And, and also how it's going to affect future work and design for our facilities. So anyone that wants to jump in there on that, I appreciate it. Hi, it's um, Neil from New Zealand. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation that our uh, lockdown was very severe um, and for as short duration as it lasted um, the, literally the country was at a standstill and that was every single thing um, there was no construction there was no movement people stayed in their homes or in the very um, close proximity to the houses so everything was shut down as we went to lift that we then had some inter-regional challenges where um, we may be open some areas and not others. And obviously one of the things that we found going forward is in a very small population, our border restrictions, where we basically have got very tight immigration controls, we've had a, a sort of shortage and still suffering a shortage of skilled workers for our construction projects. So they're all open again, but we're now struggling to deal with the effects of that after. Chris, Chris, in case yeah. of a Indonesian, we only uh, postpone become to well, next year, but we not stop the project. We're going, uh, we, st uh, we still continue the project, 
but the budget is uh, cut off by 50% because for the uh, part sheet. Thank you very much. Oh, Chris. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so uh, in the case of Chile, I, I show my presentation that way, just uh, have a, uh, a peak of uh, less workers, but uh, all the constructions never stop. Never stop. All the projects never stop. We just uh, uh, continue with the restrictions of less people, uh, slow uh, uh, delivery materials, slow services, but the performance was slow. That's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Marcelo. And, and another question to all presenters. What were the major changes in your approach to damage assessments? Has there been any move from a manual data capture methods to a more digital way of working? Anyone's had any experience with that? Oh, well, well, uh, again, me, Chris, sorry. <laughs> well, Chilean case was uh, specifically about that, <laughs> about the improvement of uh, passing from the digitization to digitalization, using our, our information. For us, the impact was an improvement. An improvement. All right, thank you, Marcelo. Uh, this question was directed to Neil. How was information disseminated? Uh, what systems were used to communicate with all parts of the country for awareness of the public about COVID-19? Yeah, so um, we had a really good communications bond nationally that was allocated by the government every single day at uh, 1 p.m. The Prime Minister and the Minister of Health and the Chief Medical Officer would come on. And I mean, every single day at one o'clock, they did a national broadcast and outlined the situation as it was at that time. Any uh, changes in uh, uh, policy or anything like that. So um, there was a whole suite of things done with excellent leadership and you could just tune into any channel or on the radio and you would hear from the Prime Minister herself uh, exactly what was happening. Uh, I mean, lifetime. It was very good. Thank you. Uh, next question is directed to Janet. Uh, while there's been a strong focus on data and people movement, there's been little consideration amongst transport professionals of the social and emotional components of travel, especially linked with mental health. Are you aware of any work being done on this? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm on a panel in two weeks that's going to discuss that particular issue. And from our research, we focus primarily on the employer and what the employer can do to help their employees. Uh, we know from natural disasters that about 10% of people who are impacted by a natural disaster have symptoms of post-traumatic stress. And about 1% develop full post-traumatic stress disorder requiring professional intervention. Now we don't know yet if those statistics will hold for the pandemic, but if they do, we have quite a few people that are gonna have long-term impacts. I think as, as leaders, what we can do is be alert to our employees and help them find resources that will help them. Knowing that for most people, about six months after a disaster, they're fine. But it takes about a six month period to recover. Now, as I keep saying, this is not a normal disaster. So we don't know how long it will be and certainly will vary from person to person. But I think being flexible, listening, and adapt, adopting policies that promote work-life balance will really help. All right, thank you, Janet. And have another question for Harry. 
Uh, how could the victim of earthquake disaster be evacuated if there is a regulation such as micro limitation of civil activity? It would seem difficult to cross the red zone area of COVID-19. I think yes, the government have a restriction to uh, Red Cross uh, zone, but in the case of the disaster, we still allowed to, to come to, to help the victim by applying the uh, uh, COVID-19 pro uh, COVID uh, protocol strictly. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that. I have another question for Neil. Chris, if I could add a little bit to that, this is Janet. Yes, go ahead. One of the things we learned with the wildfires is to think twice about evacuating. Are there ways that you can bring resources to the people impacted rather than taking them to the resources. And secondly, to evacuate smaller groups together instead of everybody just showing up at the high school gymnasium or whatever you usually do. And that seemed to help limit the spread of the disease. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, next question here uh, for Neil. Behavior change is an essential component of effective disaster management and mitigation. Did the New Zealand Transportation Agency or any partners have a specific strategy for addressing and monitoring this? Yeah, I think that comes back to the, um, the leadership shown around the communications plan. The expectations were set to, um, to the country and to our citizens about the standards of um, what was expected and what we needed to do in this team of five million to make sure that we stayed COVID free. So it was very clear everybody knew what their expectation was around their behaviour. Then obviously there's a lot of measures uh, that we were able to do and, and their, their existing ones, you know, measuring the responses through our transport system and the wearing of masks and how our public transport was being used. So yes, we changed the behavior and yes, we monitored it. All right, thank you for that. Uh, another question for Harry. Uh, how were the injured people's needs addressed in the condition of, of a COVID-19 patient? Is there a different government sector for managing natural disaster and COVID-19 or is it the same? And if so, how do they tackle both? Yeah, I think uh, together the same. So during the natural disaster, the, also the Ministry of, of Health are coming together. So in case of the COVID-19 uh, uh, disaster happened, we apply the protocol, COVID protocol to help uh, pick them. Thank you. All right, thank you. We've got a few more questions here. Uh, another question for, for Neil. You mentioned that there's a shortage of construction workers in New Zealand. What about safety specialists and transport planners? Yeah, I think, um, I don't know the specific details about individual roles. When I talk about construction workers, I probably mean construction in the broadest possible sense. And that's everything through the design, the construction, the maintenance and operations after. And I think the summary for that is because the border has been closed now for 18 months. Um, we have got some of our staff who are uh, stuck in the UK, in Australia. Um, we've got a significant push um, in our construction projects to stimulate the economy. And I think that we there are specialists required all over, but specifically in what roles, I, I wouldn't know. Apologies. All right, thank you, Neil. Uh, another question for Harry. If we consider time lag from disease, outbreak, epidemic, pandemic state, in the case of COVID-19 containment measures, uh, were not properly implemented on time or non-existent at the origin location. So the question is, as part of future-proofing international community against pandemics, how do you see the role of intelligence gathering and development of international laws to make concerned national 
quickly report issues. Intelligent. I'm sorry, do you need me to repeat the question? Yes, please. Yes, so the question is, as part of future-proofing international community against pandemics, how do you see the role of intelligence gathering and development of international laws to make concerned nations quickly report issues? Yes, I think uh, as in my presentation there, yeah, because when we know the the infrastructure or others uh, in uh, in the front before the disaster, so we can quickly to define uh, what kind, what type, and how big and uh, how big uh, the 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 impact to the infrastructure in in uh, in the front before we come to the site. So we can send maybe uh, the rescuing by uh, uh, addressing the target in quicker. I think uh, it is the, our target for the future. Thank you. All right, thank you. And the last question I have here is directed towards Janet. If we look at COVID-19's quick transmission, we can't predict precisely everywhere they stayed. I assume that means COVID positive individuals. How could we avoid them when we are crowded in a transportation vehicle? The vaccine can only protect us from specific virus, not all of virus, the variants. Well, that's the challenge we have now, isn't it? Um, I still wear my mask to the grocery store, even though public health guidance in the US now says that we don't have to. Um, I was on our subway here in Washington DC yesterday, and I would say probably 80% of people were still wearing masks. So the best offense is a good defense, as far as I'm concerned and take care of yourself. Talk to your friends who haven't been vaccinated. See if you can talk them into it. In the meantime, transportation has done a lot to improve the ventilation systems on these closed circuits like airplanes and subways. And that's some of the work that will, some of the improvement that will continue even after the pandemic's over. So we're trying to reduce the risk on a systemic basis, but we still need individuals to take this seriously, particularly with all the variants that are coming out. All right. Thank you so much for that. And I believe that's the final question that we had submitted through the chat. Hopefully I didn't miss anyone's question. So I want to thank everybody for, for taking the time to, to put those questions in and thank, uh, thank everybody for, for the time to answer those. I'm going to now turn it back over to Yukio and Herbie for final comments and to wrap up our webinar. So Yukio. Yes, thank you, Chris. So thank you for the, uh, all the speakers for providing the uh, uh, excellent the, uh, experiences. And also the, uh, thank you all the audience for attending and uh, participating in this webinar. Javi and I will say a few words for the uh, wrap up of this uh, webinar. I'll say first. So no matter what the disaster is, no matter what the pandemic is, we as road administrators must minimize the uh, imp disaster impact to our transportation infrastructure. We have learned that our mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery model is effective for COVID-19, but we have room to adjust and improve our model in preparing for the uh, next pandemic. As we learned from the, uh, today's presentations, one of the directions for the uh, better disaster management is the uh, digital transformation. The technical committee of PIRC 
will be shifting to study the uh, digital transformation in disaster management. We are looking forward to your support on our activity. So Herbie, could you add your words to me? Sure. Um, I wish to thank the Transportation Research Board and allowing us to collaborate with PRC on this webinar's important topic. In the United States of America, TRB connects our 50 states and many territories with research that can be made operational. For example, Janet Benini talked about TRB's pandemic uh, playbook for transportation agencies. Uh, it may be used to create or update your organization's pandemic plan, and uh, it's free since the TRB source document is online for immediate download. TRB's website is always a great place. It's also a great place to start the uh, and research and get timely information. And PARC, also known as the World Road Association, does this for the world, helping to level the playing field and aiding in technology transfer and increasing the, the intellectual capacity for all nations. Uh, this webinar is a great example of this. Their website is also full of pertinent, timely, and useful information. So please take advantage of the resources made available to you through these two great organizations. I would also uh, like to thank all of our speakers for their great presentation. Most of all, thanks to those participants that chimed in. Hopefully we can all make a difference and uh, please stay safe, everyone. Thank you. All right, thank you, Yukio and Herbie. And thanks again to all of our speakers and everyone in attendance today. Uh, we do appreciate that. And this does conclude our webinar. So have a nice day. Thank you. <laughs>